Let's pray, and then we will get into what I want to share. So, Father, as we get into, you know, just focusing our attention on you, remembering that you don't change. You're the same today, yesterday, and forever. No matter what goes on around us, what's happening in the world, this crazy world that we live in right now, Lord, um, thankful that we can run to you. You are our refuge. You are our strong tower. And we gladly run into you, Lord, to find safety. Thank you that we can always turn to you. And you're always there. Lord, even if we've left and we've gone astray and we've changed a bit, we come back to you, you're the same. You're the rock. Lord, and I pray that as we study today that our feet will once again be firmly planted on that rock, the rock of Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So kind of, you know, what I've, I've been reading through the book of Judges in my quiet time, in my devotional time. And, you know, usually I read through chapters of, you know, as, in, but this time as I'm going through it this year for a long time, I've been kind of really going slow. And sometimes I'll, I'll read maybe only two chapters or three chapters and I'll read it two or three times in a row. You know, to, I'm trying to let it sink in a little bit and kind of absorb it a bit more than I have, you know, and, and rather I want to make sure that I'm even cross-referencing, getting the context and the whole thing. And, but Judges is an interesting book. It's a time of only around 300 years in the, in the nation of Israel, 1354 to 1051 B.C., about 300 years during the time of the Judges. And during that time, I'm just going to read some verses to you to give you a bit of a context of, as we lay a foundation for what I want to share. Judges 3, verse 7 says, So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. How many people have forgotten the Lord their God? We probably never have really consciously forgot him. We always know he's there, but we kind of forgotten to live for him, maybe. And I think that children of Israel never forgot the stories that their fathers told them, but they just forgot to live for him. They started to live for other things. And they did evil as a result. Judges 3.12, and the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. So as a result of them doing evil in the sight of the Lord, now they get brought back into bondage. Remember, where did, where did the children of Israel come from? Egypt, a place of bondage. And God brought them into the promised land, the land of Canaan. You know, and, and he got rid of the inhabitants of the land for them, and he set them free to live there, and he warned them. He warned them, you know, if you forget me, then you're going to be back, back in the bondage. And this is exactly what happens. They did evil, they forgot the Lord, and, and they were back in bondage to the nation of Moab. And this is the, the, the repetition that you see in the book of Judges is they get in the bondage. God gives them a, a judge. They cry out to the Lord. They repent and they, God, they, you know, God gives them a deliverer. And they're good for a while while that deliverer is alive. And, but when he dies, they kind of forget and they go back and forth. Um, Judges 4.1, when Ehud was dead, he's the guy that delivered them from Moab, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. You'd think that they would learn their lesson, right? God was gracious with them. 
God saved them again. God delivered them again. And then again, they do evil in the sight of the Lord. Judges 6, 1. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And of course, you guys remember the story. God raised up Gideon to deliver them. They get brought back into bondage once again. 10, 6. Then the children again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Amazing. You know? And served the Baals and the Asherahs, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, and the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So they get evil, they forsook the Lord, they served all these other things, all these other gods. But they didn't serve the Lord. They didn't forget him, I don't think, but they just forgot to serve him. You know, and, and I want you to think about this. Think about your own life. What are you serving? What are you really serving? I know that we're all here. We haven't forgot the Lord. We, we love Jesus, but are we really serving him or have we forgotten to serve him? Are we serving ourselves, our own pleasures? You, you have to evaluate your own heart, your own life. And finally, 13, verse 1 in Judges, Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Again, <laughs> again and again and again. It, you know, and sometimes we can be a little hard on Israel, can't we? Like, what is wrong with you guys? Can't you learn a lesson? You know, you want to grab a hold of them by the scruff of the neck and knock on their head and say, what's wrong with you? Why, how could you be so stubborn? You know, if I was a, an Israelite and I had that history, you know, we, we kind of put ourselves in that position and maybe become a little judgmental even of them, don't we? But then look at our own nation. <laughs> what happened to, where's George Washington when you need him? You know, where's Abraham Lincoln? Where's the man of God that will lead our country when we need him the most? In this world that is in turmoil, France has rejected God, and, and, and now this has happened, and I pray that they would turn back to him, that they would realize that they did evil in the sight of God, and they served other things. They forgot to serve the Lord, and they'll turn to him. So that they can be healed, their land can be healed. We're just 240 years old. 1776. I remember when I was a kid on the way to Corona, 91 freeway in the, in the 76 freeway, there's that little dam. And they, I remember when they painted 1776. It was 1976 when they painted that, it was our 200th birthday. That was a while ago. I was still in high school in 1976. Graduated in 1979. 240 years, look at our country. How can we look at Israel and with any kind of judgment? How can we look at them and say, how come they didn't get it? What's wrong with them? What's wrong with us? Again, the children of the United States did evil in the sight of the Lord. When are we going to learn our lesson? Can we serve other gods? Can we do other things, serve other things, and, and not serve God and expect anything else to happen to us than what's currently happening? What about personally? I think, I think we can all relate to Israel after walking with them for, for a time, right? After we've walked with the Lord for a time, we can put our name in there. So, so Aaron <laughs> did evil in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again, Aaron did evil. We can all relate to that to a certain degree. We, we can all relate. And, you know, we have times uh, uh, of 
you know, good times of serving the Lord, but then maybe we become complacent. We've struggled with that in our own lives. And we've not served God. We forgot to serve Him, and we started serving others, started serving ourselves, doing what was right in our own eyes. That's another thing about the judges. They, they, there was no king in Israel, so they, every man did what was right in his own eyes. They, they followed their heart. They, th- they did what they thought was right and good. You know what I mean? They, this was all right. But they forgot. The Lord. The Lord gave them how to live. How, how to live a right life. How to live a good life. A life that he could bless. You know, and when, when they didn't live that life and, and they got themselves back into bondage, they reap what they sowed. You cannot live apart from from God and expect to be blessed. When you serve other things, God's not going to let you do it. Because he loves you. Because he loves you. There will be destruction as a result of your living for yourself. If, If we sow to the flesh, from the flesh we will reap destruction. We can't get away. We're not going to be the one person that that spiritual law does not apply to. It applies to every human being. Is there something out there that we can hold on to through all of this change, all of this craziness? Is there something solid to stand on? Is there something I can grab a hold of when everything around me is so unstable? When everything in me personally is so unstable? (laughs) Rod left to himself. Oh, what a sad sight that is. I just got my transcripts because uh, I've got a, I'm going for um, my degree from the Hungarian campus, so I had to get my high school cra- transcripts, and I looked at them, and I couldn't believe it, you know. <laughs> they... they I had 10 credits just for work experience because, I don't know, I was in continuation high school my last couple of years. And living in this country <laughs> when it changes so rapidly and, and you kind of, well, what do I do now? How do I live? What, you know, and, and all the internal struggles that we go through, is there something to hold on to? There is. I want to encourage you. There is something that you can turn to right now and you can grab a hold of. It's not a something. It's a someone. It's the person, Jesus Christ, who doesn't change. We can be thankful that there is someone that we can turn to, someone that will help us that will give us some surety some assurance some stability how many people need some stability there's only one place and that's the person of Jesus Christ I'm going to share a little bit of a complicated passage in Hebrews chapter 6 if you have your Bible turn it Hebrews chapter 6. But I am thankful this Thanksgiving, I am thankful that God is unchanging. In Hebrews chapter 6, it says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. So, um, there was nothing else he could swear by. There was no one else greater, so he swore by himself. He made this promise, and he said, it's going to happen. How's it going to happen? Because I'm going to make it happen. That's how he said. That's what he said. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. 
who met, for men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. See, we have kind of like a, a contract, right? When two parties want to make a contract or an agreement or, you know, if I want to build a house, we're going to have a contract and you're going to, in the contract, there's going to be all the uh, terms of how much you're going to pay, when you're going to pay, and what I'm going to do and, and what I have to do to get those payments. There's a contract and that contract is legal and binding. And when we have a contract, there's no more dispute. You just look at the contract and did you do it? Then you're required to pay. And in a court of law, that contract will stand. A, an oath for them ends all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two things, immutable things, in which is, it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So immutability, that's a big word, right? What does that mean? Well, Webster simply says it means not capable or susceptible to change. So God is immutable. He does not change. Nelson's Bible Dictionary, a characteristic of God's nature, which means that he does not change in his basic nature. God is the same. He's, he doesn't change. James 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. What God says, who God is, is who he will always be. God does not mutate. And that's where the kind of the word comes from, right? Um, we might mutate. He does not mutate from being one kind of God to being another kind of God. He's the same God. Who God was at the beginning is who God will be at the end. You know, he doesn't have a beginning or an end. We have a beginning and an end. Time has a beginning and an end. God's the same throughout it all. God's the same. It's the same God that swore to Abraham. The same God that swears to us. The same God that fulfilled his oath to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater. He swore by himself. And during that time, Abraham, in chapter 15, he says, you know, how, am I, how do I know that this promise is going to come to pass? How am I going to know that? When he, well, God appeared to him the first time, he's already 75 years old. And now he's promised that he's going to have descendants. He had no children. His wife was barren. He wasn't, Isaac the son of promise, was not born until he was 100 years old, about 100 years old. So after God made this promise, he said, how do I, go, how do I know this is going to happen? I mean, I'm already an old man. You know, there's just no way. And so God appeared to him, and, and, and he said, this is how you're going to know. And he said, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but the, he did not cut the birds in two, so he put those on there. So he cut all these animals up, and he put them on one side or another. And this is how they made an agreement. This is how they made a contract in this day, in this culture, is that the two parties would walk down in between the animals, and they would recite their part of the contract as they did. It's kind of like a handshake early on. And, you know, handshakes don't work anymore, right? You can't do business on a handshake anymore because people are liars. But um, here they would walk down, and they would recite their um, part of the agreement. And the dead animals on the side kind of said, well, if I don't, if I don't hold up my end of the bargain, you know, this is... Um, it's not a good thing, you know. And so 
here they make the, and then when it came time to walk through, Abraham fell, to, fell into a deep sleep. And a burning torch representing God came and passed through the animal. Symbolizing that this promise that I'm going to fulfill is based on me. I promise, I can promise, I can swear by no one greater, and so I'm going to swear by myself. I'm going to pass through this, and I am going to accomplish these things for you, Abraham. I'm going to do it. And the promise came to pass. God does not change. What he says happens will happen. Jesus Christ, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus does not change to accommodate you. Jesus does not change to accommodate the culture. He is the same. He's always been, it's the same Jesus that came into the world, and we're going to be celebrating Christmas, celebrating when Jesus came and became man, the incarnation, when God, the second person of the Trinity, left his glorious position in heaven and came down to earth. You know, it's the same Jesus. The same things that he said, the, the same principles that he stood for, they, they never change. And that's a glorious thing. I'm so thankful that I don't have to worry about him changing. Because everything around here, you know, it's going to be election time, right? <laughs> well, I wonder how many politicians are going to change their positions. in order to get our votes. Or I wonder how many of them are going to actually say that they're going to do something and they won't. That's never happened before, right? They make promises, but they don't keep their promise. But God's not like a man. So we can't impose upon God the way we are down here. God's not like a politician. God states the truth. And it's for everybody, everywhere, at any time. It's for us today. And it's for us to let that truth come and transform our lives, change us. Have you ever gone shopping with your wife? When I go shopping with my wife, I love those stores that have a man chair. You know what a man chair is? It's a store that has a, a chair in it. I don't care. A place to sit. I can go there and I can sit and I can look at my phone and watch my wife kind of look at everything. And she'll, what do you think about this? Oh, that's nice. Oh, that, that's nice too. I, you know what I mean? What am I supposed to say? If I say anything else, I'm in trouble, right? <laughs> you, you learn to figure out how, to, how this works. I think I'm going to get this one. No, I don't. I think I'm, you know what I mean? Ch ch okay, yeah, it's great. You know? <laughs> Reading up on my team arsenal, the man chair. Every store should have it. Everything changes. But God does not change. The immutability of God. I am so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that when I turn to him, he's still there, still the same. No matter what I've done, no matter what I've been going through, no matter what situations there are, I can turn to him, and he's still the same. And I'm thankful that not only does God doesn't change, his word never changes. His word never changes. If God doesn't change, his word doesn't change. Psalm 38, 138, verse 2. says, you have magnified your word above your name. Now, the name kind of represented everything that 
you were. Like, my, my name is everything, right? If my name is no good, then I'm no good. Is the kind of the concept. And, and God magnified his word above his name. Psalm 8.1 says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth who have set your glory above the heavens. There is one God. There's one God in heaven. And his name is excellent in all of the earth. Anybody that turns to him will find him. But they have to find him on his conditions, not their conditions. We will honor his name in heaven. When we get to heaven, we will honor his name. Revelation 15, 4. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your thoughts for your judgments have been manifested. But your name is only as good as your word, isn't it? If your word is no good, then your name is no good. Something that I've been really praying for, something the Lord's been laying on my heart over and over, is my devotion life is integrity. I want everything that I do to be done in, with integrity. You know, I mean, I'm in a position of, of authority. I'm in a posi position of trust. And um, authority corrupts. And absolute authority corrupts absolutely. I have people that keep me accountable, but I can easily abuse my authority. And nobody, you know, there aren't too many people that can call me on it if I so set myself up. But I don't want to do that. I want the things that I do to be done with integrity. I want my name to be able to, to mean something. That when I say something, people will believe me. I don't want to be another one of the pastors that fell with either the glory, stealing the glory, stealing the money, or stealing the women. Those are three things that pastors need to be on guard. You know, we have to have integrity. You're only as, as, your name is only as good as your word. If your word isn't any good, your name will not be respected. Therefore, God magnified his word above his name so that his name will be magnified and glorified. I'm thankful that God's word does not change because God does not change, therefore his word does not change. You might want to change it, and you can try all you want, but he, he won't listen. Jesus said in seven, uh, John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The word of God, the Holy Bible, 66 books, Inside one Bible, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. Somewhere around 40 authors, all inspired to bring us God's word, God's message, God's communication. You know, what's in the mind of God, what's in the heart of God. He brought it to us in his word. He also did it through his living word, Jesus Christ, but he brought it, in, and we have, when we read this, this is God's mind, God's thoughts, God's heart expressed in a language that we can grasp. And this truth, this word does not change. It's still a bestseller. You know, Harry Potter has come and gone. <laughs> they were bestsellers once, right? The Hunger Games have come and... No, they're still, they're still here, aren't they? No, that... They, what's the one? And what's the one that's in this? Uh, Mocking Jay has come, still here, but it will go. 
but the Bible will still be a bestseller. You know? And it's a good read, too. That's why it's a good bestseller, because it's a good read. And the Bible is no good unless you read it. <laughs> you might use it for uh, decoration. You might use it for paperweight so your papers can't get away from you. <laughs> but there are other things that will serve better. But if you read it, it's indispensable. If you have a Bible, read it. If you don't have a Bible, we will give you one so you can read it. In the midst of a world where there are lies thrown at us all the time, we come up and we go, what is the truth? Remember old Pontius Pilate? He asked you, well, what is truth? What is the truth? You know, I mean, he was confused. I don't think, I, I think it was kind of a sarcastic, like anybody can really come up with the truth. Well, you can. God's word is truth. I'm so thankful. You know, politicians are going to lie to you, salesmen. I, you know, God bless salesmen, but I always wonder, is he trying to sell me something because I actually need this, or is he trying to sell me something because he needs to sell something? And it's always a little bit of both. I always like it, love it when I meet somebody that when I know somebody and he's a Christian and then you know he's he's looking out out for my best interest because I always wondered do I really need this or is he is he lying to me? You go to a, a, a car dealer. How much is this one? How much you got? <laughs> I, I, that wasn't my question. I, none of your business. How much I got? But there's always this negotiable, and you wonder, am I, you know, am I, am I the gullible one that's going to give them way too much, or am I the, the shrewd one that's going to bring them down to that bottom line, you know? I just wait, what is the bottom line? What will you sell? What you, just give me the price. Religion. Religion. How many people have people come into their door from different religions? The Jehovah Witnesses have been to my door. The Mormons have been to my door. Everybody's trying to sell me something. Is it the truth? How can I know it's the truth? Can two things that are opposite be true? Can Jesus be the incarnate Son of God, which the Bible says, or is he a created being, which the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons say? Can they both be true? They, they cannot be true. Uh, you, you can't do it, right? Jesus is either the Son of God or he is a created being. How do I know which one he is? Well, God's word. God's word. The word is truth. Test it. Test it and see if it's true. A never changing cross in an ever changing culture. I'm thankful that his word declares that his grace is sufficient for me. Romans 5.20, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Maybe you feel you were a little bit too sinful today. <laughs> Aaron, how does that feel? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you sin too much. I mean, God, surely I've gone too far. Well, here's the truth. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. You can't out-sin the grace of God. That's the truth. So if you turn from your sin and turn back to God, he's still the same. He hasn't changed. He still is there, and his grace is sufficient for you. 
My grace is sufficient. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. My grace is sufficient for you. Turn to me, and I'm still here. I'm a rock, man. I don't change. God, I'm speaking of God. I change all the time. I vacillate right now. You know. God doesn't change. Turn to me. I'm still here. Boom. Rock. Rock. Solid ground. Immovable. Immutable. I'm thankful for his mercy. I don't know about you, but I need God's mercy. Lamentations 3.22 through 24. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. <laughs> if it wasn't for God's mercy, it would be like little piles of ashes on every chair in the room, you know? The biggest pile right here. You know, like firecrackers going off in this room we be consumed. But his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. When you turn, when you need mercy, you turn to God, here he is. He's a rock. I'm still here. I still have it for you. I'm still the one that you need. There's no one else. Nothing else. But when you turn to me, I have the goods. I don't just make promises that I can't keep. And I've proven it. Read my word. Look at Abraham. Look what I did for him. Look at these other men. Look what I've done. I am not just talk. You know, um, pack a good punch too. I'm thankful for God's love. Are you thankful for God's love? First yes. Corinthians 13, 8 simply says, love never fails. God's love never fails. <laughs> Maybe you're going through situations and that situation, that trial, it's, you're kind of interpreting it and it's kind of saying to you, God doesn't love me anymore. If God loved me, why is he allowing this to happen? Have you ever interpreted a situation in your life and that's the message that you got? How many have got that message from a situation in life? Raise your hand. You guys are all like skittish. Like, we don't want to read my... <laughs> but you can always turn back to God. Turn to God, and there he is. His love is still there. It never fails. It's always there. So I, I'm thankful that there is someone that I can always rely upon, and that someone is God. I'm thankful for who he is. I'm thankful that he doesn't change. When everything around me seems to be crumbling, there's someone that I can turn to to get me through. Psalm 46, 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, through the mount, though the mountains shake with its swelling. I won't be afraid of anything because God is my refuge. I always have a place of safety that I can run to. Psalm 61, verse 3. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. Have you found your strong tower? Have you found the place of refuge that you can run to? The place of safety? That you can grab a hold of something of substance to carry you through 
Proverbs 18, 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. I'm thankful for God. Then I can turn to him and he is there. Just the way I left him. <laughs> you know, doesn't change a bit. And I can run into him again. And I can be safe. I can be safe. No matter what the enemy, my flesh, this world throws at me. I, in Christ, I have a place of safety. So Heavenly Father,